What's going on guys? It's your boy Potato Jet. We're what did I tell you about <gasps> Potato to be me? Honestly, I go on B and H and I go, which one's the biggest one? I'll take this one. Just buy that. Yes. One. Yeah. I'll take this one. Sound stuff is complicated as hell. But luckily, Alex is here to simplify it for me. What is a cardioid? What is a condenser? What is a dynamic? What is phantom? We're gonna learn all that. Go look up his IMDb if you just wanna see a massive list of awesome projects that he's done. Some part of sound for it. Frequency numbers always confuse me. What is a frequency range? Good way to remember how to deal with that. The human ear generally responds to 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz or 20 to 20. So deep low sounds like or bass, it's all down here. And on the high end, it sounds like That's annoying, sorry. Generally, when you're talking about the human voice, most of our voices live somewhere between about 100 hertz and up to about eight to nine kilohertz of useful information. Everything above eight or nine kilohertz is just kind of sibilant, high-end weirdness that's not really necessary. And anything below 100 hertz is just a lot of rumble that you generally don't really need to get the point across. So if we take a look at a spectrum analyzer, you'd see that the fundamental resonance of my voice is around 200 to 300 hertz. There's a little bit of information below that, but it's not really necessary for the human voice. And then everything above that is gonna be useful information. So you get a little bit of the, what are called the low mids, that's around 250 to 500 hertz. The mid range, which is 500 to about 2K. Then you get the high mids, which is 2K to about 4K. And then everything above that is just gonna be high end air or brightness. Most of the information that you wanna keep from the human voice is right around those low mids into the high mids. It's all between about 300 hertz to about three kilohertz. So a lot of the time in post-production, we'll just get rid of the frequencies that we don't necessarily want. But the nice thing about having them recorded is we get to choose after the fact. The other thing is when you're selecting microphones, you want to try and find a mic that flatters your voice and that's going to be a little bit different for everybody. So it's important to test all these things out for yourself when you're going to make a purchase. So I think the biggest question everyone's asking is what microphones should you get? And from what I'm learning from Alex, it's going to depend a whole lot on what you're trying to record. If you're trying to record voices or sound effects or what, it's like always different and it's confusing and overwhelming for me. When it comes to YouTubers or vloggers, these three are are probably the most popular one, and this is the Rode Video Micro. Now, this one's a pretty great option because it's very compact, it's very inexpensive, under 50 bucks, and it gets power from just the mic jack on the camera. All right, so here's the sound from the Rode Video Micro. Alex, what do you think of the sound quality out of this thing? It's not the greatest, it's a little bit thin, doesn't really flatter the voice very much. I think you could probably do better, but if you're just looking to get started an entry-level microphone for vlogging, this is gonna do fine. Yeah, definitely considering the price point, Point, it's definitely an upgrade from the onboard microphone. Now we're gonna switch over to this Shure VP83, which is one that I use for a while. So the downside of this is that it requires a double A battery and you have to remember to turn it on. If you don't turn it on, then you're gonna do an awesome vlog and realize you weren't recording sound and that sucks. A lot of you guys are like, crap, I did that yesterday. <laughs> it happens, especially if you're on the spur of the moment during a vlog, you're gonna forget to turn that mic on and you're gonna be pissed that there's no audio from your vlog. But with the battery power in there, you're gonna get a much better, fuller quality of sound. So let's slap this on real quick. So here's the sound quality out of the Shure VP83 and the sound levels coming out of the microphone since it's battery powered is a little bit hotter. So I get to turn down the sensitivity a bit on the camera resulting in less noise. How's it sound? This is a little bit better. It's a little bit warmer. It flatters the voice a little bit more. It doesn't do wonders for it, but you can tell there's not quite as much top end weirdness. There's not as much low end response. It kind of accentuates the mid range just right for the human voice. So pretty good option. So here's finally the one I got recently, and this is the Rode VideoMic Pro Plus. To me, the clear big advantage that this has is the fact that you can plug it in and it is battery powered, so it sounds great, but also it knows when you turn on the camera, so it automatically detects a camera being turned on and turns on for you. So here's the sound out of the Rode Video Mic Pro Plus. And again, this is battery powered, but I love it because I don't have to turn on the microphone separately. I think this is probably the best of the bunch. It's a little bit more directional, so you kind of have to be right in front of the microphone to be able to get the best sound quality out of it, but it sounds really good. 
and it flatters the voice, at least my voice, so all of the sibilance and the high end that you kind of don't really want, it's not as present, and all the low end is still clear and crisp without being too muddy. And once again, here is how the Rode Video Micro sounds on this camera. And here's how my voice sounds for comparison. My voice on the VP83. And again, mine for comparison. And here's the Rode Video Mic Pro Plus. And again, this is my voice on that mic. Can we trade voices? <laughs> I like your voice better. Besides the power button, what the heck does the rest mean? Right over here, you've got what's called a high pass filter, and that basically takes and rolls off all the low end frequencies beneath whatever frequency it says. So you've got 75 and you've got 150. Generally, all of your wind noise, all of the stuff that buffets the microphone and causes that nice <laughs> kind of crap, that's all wind down below 150 hertz. So if you know that you're gonna be in a windy environment, set it to 75. If you're gonna be in a nice indoor controlled space like this, don't use it at all. It's gonna pick up a little bit more natural bottom end of the voice. And if you're in a really crazy area or you're recording a little bit of a higher pitched voice, you can get away with 150, but I wouldn't ever really recommend using that unless there's a specific reason to. So back here, there's a minus 10 and a plus 20. From my experience, I almost always have it on zero if I'm just talking straight to the camera and I generally speak pretty loud. And then I guess if we're trying to record some butterflies flapping their wings, then we'll turn on the plus 20. If we're at a rock concert, minus 10. Sounds about right. Another pretty common option for vloggers is to use a lavalier. So you can actually see I'm kind of wearing one right now. This is a Sennheiser G4, which is very, very popular for kind of the mid-level professional field. Very good sound quality, good clear audio. And this can transmit audio straight to the camera so you don't have to worry about syncing in post. But this might be a little bit overkill for vlogging. They just came out with an XS series, which is probably something to look into. It's more compact and less expensive, so definitely a pretty solid option and finally the least expensive option is to just get like a little microphone and just plug it into your phone and they build lavalier mics for your phone so you could record with your phone and then record video on the camera and then you can sync them in post but the issue with that is sometimes you might forget to hit record on your phone and you have to sync so it's a little bit more work so if I'm gonna be running and gunning and just recording from a lavalier I would personally prefer to just be able to send this signal straight to the camera so that I don't have to worry about syncing and accidentally forgetting to record after. So the most important thing to consider whenever you start recording anything is what you're recording because that's going to determine everything else. When I'm recording say wind, I'm not going to pick a microphone that I'd use on vocals because they're completely different things. You can record wind? Yeah, it's one of the most important things to record. It's also one of the most challenging things to record. Wait, how the heck do you record wind? <laughs> Does that, is that pretty good wind or what? Yeah, that's exactly how we've done it. <laughs> No, Wait. this is how you record it. <laughs> so this is a Sennheiser 8040, which is a small cap condenser microphone inside of a Rykot Zeppelin. And uh, what does that mean? You've got a wind jammer or a dead cat, and then the Zeppelin itself, which is plastic and acoustic foam that kind of dampens a lot of the buffeting wind that you'd get when you're outside. And inside of this is a teeny tiny microphone that is basically tailored to pick up really quiet sounds. It's very sensitive to the world around it. It's very disappointing to see how small that microphone is inside of all that crap. <laughs> I mean, you have to compensate for the size of the microphone. <laughs> Check out this microphone. That's why you always leave this one out now, of there. Now we're talking sound. That's essentially just a giant one of these. Huh? Kind of. It's it's a more expensive, more versatile one of those. There are plenty of other companies that are making wind jammers like that, and most of them are viable options. Polar pattern is another huge factor in what microphone I'm going to choose. And there are plenty of different polar patterns out there. You've got omnidirectional, you've got cardioid, you've got supercardioid, you've got hypercardioid, you've got shotgun. So omnidirectional microphones will pick up anything around them, all the way around the mic. They don't reject anything. It's, if you put it in a space, it's gonna record everything in that space. So lavaliers are generally omnidirectional, right? Because it's recording everything from the side and top. Right, and when you think about it, you've got this thing hidden away somewhere right here. As soon as your talent is going to turn their head and talk this way and talk this way, you don't want that to change a whole lot, so you want the microphone to be picking up about the same kinds of sound. I have it in the middle here. It should be recording in all directions, so I can talk. 
I can talk. And it sounds great. I'll just run around like events. Hey, so how are you doing today? <laughs> what do you think of this rain we're getting? I don't like you very much. <laughs> so this is omnidirectional. No matter where I am in perspective to the microphone, it's capturing. The alternative to that is supercardioid or hypercardioid. There's not too much of a difference in pickup pattern between the two of them. Narrow pickup pattern in front, and they reject a lot of information to the sides. So they're great for picking up voices indoors and outdoors. So this is the Audio-Technica 4053B. This is a hypercardioid microphone. So it's gonna pick up really, really well directly in front of the mic, and it's gonna reject everything around the mic into the rear of it. So if I go off axis a little bit, you'll see that this doesn't really sound very good. This doesn't really sound very good. Coming back over to here, this is exactly where you want to be. The other thing is when you're recording any kind of human voice, you want to point directly into the chest, kind of between the, the mouth and the neck area here, and that'll reject all of the kind of weird sorts of sounds that you don't want at all and pick up more of the natural resonance of the voice. And then here's some sound from the Rode VideoMic Pro Plus that we were talking about earlier. It's a super cardioid, which is similar to the hypercardioid, but a little bit wider up front. So you get a little bit more range in the front. And also notice that there's kind of like that little bubble on the back, which is more like a side effect than like a bleed in through the back. So you can hear me back here a little bit, but it just doesn't sound as good. I really don't like how muffled it kind of sounds but it does pick it up because i am in that bubble but generally speaking you really want to be right here in front of it if you're trying to record somebody in a room talking and you don't want to get too much of the room you want to pick something that's going to laser focus in on their voice that's where something like a small shotgun will come into play this has a really narrow response that only picks up what's right in front of it so it's really good for picking up the human voice and it's what you see on pretty much every film set there is 416 is a shotgun microphone and shotgun mics have the same benefits and the same problems as super and hypercardioids. They pick up what's in front of them really, really well, but they also pick up what's behind them a little bit too. So you can get a little bit of my information here. And as I get around to the front again, you'll hear that this sounds much better. But when it goes to the sides, I'm pretty much gone in comparison to what I was like before it was in front and back. So finally, there's cardioid pattern, which is a little bit wider in the front than supercardioid or the hypercardioid. It's gonna pick up more of what's in front of the microphone and to the sides a little bit, but still reject everything that's behind it. So this Shure SM7B is a cardioid mic, and now this Sennheiser 8040 is also a cardioid. So since we have the 8040, I should sound pretty good, even if I'm kind of off axis a little bit, but once I get behind, it probably sounds pretty bad. It's gonna sound terrible, but I'm gonna sound great. You sound fantastic right now. So now that we've talked about polar patterns, let's talk a little bit about the differences between dynamic microphones and condenser microphones. So I've got the 8040 here. This is a, again, a cardioid condenser. This is a cardioid dynamic mic over here. Dynamic mic has a little bit more natural resonance to it in the low mids. It rolls off a little bit of the high end and it kind of has the voice as its sweet spot where it flatters everything pretty nicely. This is also gonna be able to take a lot more abuse so you can use this as a hammer, you can throw it into the street, not care, you can do whatever to it and it's just gonna keep going. I would say a majority of microphones out there are condensers, right? And dynamic microphones I see mostly for podcasts because you can be right up here and it has that nice radio voice, especially when you're up close to it. With a live environment, you're gonna want something that's gonna pick up what's right in front of it, it's gonna reject the world around it and you're gonna be able to throw it into a crowd and have it stampeded and pick it back up and it's gonna work just fine. Dynamics are generally the way to go and they're also usually a little bit cheaper than condenser microphones. Whereas these are great in controlled environments like music studios or in a recording environment like a Foley stage. Condensers are great, they sound a little bit more natural, they pick up the environment around them a little bit better. It's gonna be a better choice in general if you're working, again, in controlled spaces. And the main reason why I'm using this SM7B Dynamic is because it does a better job at rejecting sounds that are kind of a little bit further away. So I noticed that I sound pretty decent even back here, but any further, I'm gonna just completely drop out, which I actually like because I live like two blocks from the freeway. There's always just like motors cycles. So I like that I don't have to worry as much about my surrounding. So one last thing to remember about condenser microphones, they need to be fed with phantom power in order to work. Dynamic microphones, you can plug them into whatever preamp and go. These, if you don't have that phantom power on, they're just going to be silent. So if you have one and you're not getting any audio out of it, that's the first thing to check. Until just now, I basically thought that this required phantom power. Now it's just like, why are you wasting energy? <laughs> but at the same time, you also have to add a lot of gain to this 
because it's a very quiet microphone opposed to these condensers that are very loud just straight out of the mic. The SM7B in pretty much any dynamic microphone is gonna be a little bit quieter on output. It's not as sensitive to the world around it. Pretty much any condenser is gonna be louder on output in comparison, even if your gain on your preamp is set to the exact same level just by nature of how these mics are constructed. But again, most important thing to consider in all of this, what are you recording? Because that's gonna determine all of your choices from there forward. So based on that, you would choose the polar pattern, the frequency response, and if you want a dynamic or condenser. So awesome. I literally did not know a majority of this stuff that we talked about today. So this actually helps me a whole lot. Sound is just such a mysterious world to me. I just like, I'm like, it sounds good. Oh, that sounds bad. No idea what's wrong with it or how to fix it. But we'll have to do another video where we just talk all about post-production sound. I posted this on Instagram a little while ago, asking you guys what you guys want to know about audio. So we're going to do a quick Q&A, but also feel free to hit up Alex Knickerbocker on Instagram and his YouTube channel, which is just launching, I kind of forced him into starting one. So go hit him up with any questions or some requests on what kind of videos you guys want to see. What's the best mic for under $50? I don't think there are any great mics for under $50 maybe you could get away with this one. There are also kind of like those lavaliers that you plug into your phone. There are some that are in that range. I've never really tested them so much, so I can't really speak on the quality out of this, but I believe this is under 50 bucks. So this is definitely an improvement over the onboard microphone. I can at least say that. John Joy Gaba, help remove clothing rustle from hidden lav recorded audio. So what we're talking about is when you wear this, you kind of just generally do this stuff. Sound sucks. So how do you clean that up? There are a lot of tools to do that that you can use both while you're recording and after the fact. I can talk a little bit about that on my own channel, which as you said, is just a little baby channel. But at the very least, we can go into noise reduction techniques and really deep dive into how to get audio from something like this pristine and clear like you'd expect in a major motion picture. How to record a toilet flushing without getting the mic wet. Okay. Hydrophones. Tips for mixing audio. That's its own video. So that might be coming in the future in one of our channels. Hey, there's another Alex out there asking how to have the money to buy a microphone. Just get some more money. Like go out to the store and just go get some more money. Yeah, that's a good idea. What's the problem? How can I get better audio quality recording outside with car noise and stuff like that? You want directional microphones for that sort of stuff. Don't get omnidirectional microphones. Get cardioids, get super cardioids, get hyper cardioids. Shotgun microphones are the most directional. That's probably going to be your best bet. Yeah, a lot of ASMR questions on here. What would be a good ASMR mic? I don't know the answer to this, but if I had to guess, you would probably want a cardioid condenser because they're sensitive and then they just kind of record this little pocket here. I don't know how to feel about this. Quick shotgun round. All right. What's your favorite shotgun mic? Oh, the Neumann RSM 191. How much does that cost? $5,000. <laughs> How about like pro level, but not $5,000? I'd say go with the Sennheiser 416. It's probably the best all around shotgun you can get. It's expensive at $1,000, but it's gonna last you forever. It can take anything that you throw at it and it's gonna sound way better than most of the other mics in its price range. Have you ever messed with like a Rode NTG2 or NTG3? I've messed with the NTG2, I don't like it. The NTG3 is kind of known as the poor man's 416. I've used it on guns. It sounds sounds really good. The voice, it sounds really good. I'd prefer the 416 if it's available, but you're gonna be able to get away with an NTG3. What's the lowest end shotgun microphone you would recommend to someone on a tight budget? I would say look at Audio-Technica's lineup. Uh, you can also find some really good used microphones that are in pretty good shape and are still gonna be able to get the job done. I often hear this camera has a better preamp than that and more what is this preamp and how does it impact audio quality? From what I understand, the sound coming out of microphones themselves are very, very quiet. So it's just like this very small electrical signal and you basically have to boost that from what I understand. You're talking about mic level versus line level. Mic level is basically a lot quieter so you need to boost it a lot more. Line level is when you've already got a preamp in front of that microphone and you're just plugging it into an interface of some kind. Like a good preamp will keep it super clean and not introduce too much noise, but then a shitty one will just make it sound terrible and bring in a lot of noise, right? Right. How not to forget to turn on a microphone. Oh man, everyone that's kind of had one of these where you have to turn it on has faced that dread. So that alone is a reason for me to recommend the Rode VideoMic Pro Plus or a dynamic microphone like the SM7B. Can you use the Rode VideoMic Pro Plus as a boom mic if you don't have the funds for a proper shotgun microphone? You can, as long as you have the cables and you have a place to put it, sure. I mean, that's an option. I used to do that with a little 
battery powered microphone. The first project that he and I worked on together, I was using a broom pole as a boom and it worked just fine. I did do that. I went to Home Depot. It was a painter's pole, you know, one right. that extends. So I took that and I made like an epoxy putty mount that mounted onto a shock mount. Work with your budget, make things work. Whatever microphone really close to the subject is generally gonna sound better than a great microphone just like poorly placed without the right support behind it. Well, thanks Alex. Don't forget to go check out his channel. And if you have any other questions about sound, send him a DM. He said he'll respond to every single one of you within two and a half minutes. If he doesn't, he will shave his beard. Holy crap, I just finished editing this video and it's over 20 minutes long. Sorry guys, I was trying to keep it kind of short. But uh, yeah, right now I'm recording on the Rode Video Micro, that inexpensive one. And I just have this microphone hooked up to a little extension cable I got for like four bucks and hooked up straight to the camera. Literally just doing this is gonna make it so much better than the onboard microphone. But yeah, the audio world, there's a whole lot to soak in. We actually started this video back in January and we did three recording sessions to try to record this video. The first time we just talked through everything and it was just so massive and overwhelming. I was like, okay, let's just leave recording and post-production sound to a whole different video because there's just way too much ground to cover here. Alex's channel is live now. It has two subscribers, one being me, one being his mom probably. So yeah, head over, show him some love because there is so much information to be unpacked in the audio world. Anyways, let's close this off by reading a few comments from the last video. Top comment was from Tyler. Goes to party place with Rubik's Cube. Sounds like a good time. <laughs> I have this tendency of getting like super obsessed with like random stuff sometimes. I really stay away from video games for that reason. If I slightly get interested in a video game, my brain would just become obsessed with it and I'll literally do nothing but think about it day in, day out. It literally take over my life. I've been getting faster though, you guys wanna see? Let's try. Boom. Holy crap, this is actually my personal best record, 24 minutes. I'm actually pretty pumped, 24 minutes, that's like, by far my best time. Favorite comments gotta be from Philip Bloom. Good to know you are happy with five inches, but would prefer an extra couple. Guys, I'm talking about monitors. Wow, Philip Bloom, I grew up watching a ton of his videos and here he is leaving dick jokes in my videos. <laughs> Life complete. I'm sure most of you guys already know who Philip Bloom is, but if you don't, definitely go check him out. He and I can never get along though, cause he is a cat guy. <laughs> that seven incher makes me feel a lot more comfortable, said by Potato Jack. God, I'm never gonna hear the end of this. Talking about five inch monitors are okay, but really, you should have a seven inch. It really doesn't help now that we're making a video about microphones. Maybe I should just delete this video before things get out of hand. Potato Jets on fire with the 15 minute mark. Well, check out this. This is probably gonna be like 22 minutes, what? Now I'm really stretching it though. So talk to you guys later. See you.